start, uh, I I just uh, you know uh, mentioned here that we had to uh, reschedule this talk. Earlier this, this was on Monday uh, because of some uh, you know unavoidable circumstances there, and I'm really grateful to Janu that he has accepted our request to reschedule this talk. And uh, last month we had a wonderful lecture from Professor Adrian Hill, who spoke on the progress of malaria vaccine, and this time. We are really fortunate to have Professor Gyanu Lavishane, who is an associate professor in the Division of Infectious Diseases, John Hopkins University School of Medicine, and his research focus on the cell wall peptidoglycan of mycobacterium tuberculosis and mycobacterium mycobacterioids abscesses. He studies basic mechanism associated with peptidoglycan, but with an intent to leverage findings to develop tools that will be useful in the clinic. His group devotes significant efforts on the developing new strategies to treat mycobacterial diseases, which is in, you know, according to WHO reports 2020, tuberculosis and malaria, uh, both are deadly assess infectious diseases. Elimination of both diseases are on the track to a long way to achieve the goal of elimination. And uh, uh, I request Professor Janu here to start with his talk, and I would really like to, you know, thank him. Janu is an old friend, and I'm really thankful uh, from NIMR, National Institute of Malaria Research, and Mira India team that he accepted an invitation to deliver a talk, especially at midnight there. Thank you so much, Janu. Thank Over you very much, Dr. Sarma, uh, for, uh, for this invitation. Uh, it's wonderful to be uh, in front of ICMR and, and to speak to this audience that I've not met, but uh, hopefully we'll get to interact in some way uh, uh, during this uh, hour. So here, um, <clears throat> uh, this, uh, our work in our laboratory spans basic science all the way to the translational aspects so that it can be useful to the clinic. Uh, and I will focus on the atypical cell wall of mycobacteria or the cell wall of mycobacteria, which is atypical. If the biochemical composition of a biomolecule is different from other bacteria, perhaps we should pay attention to that uh, aspect for the regards to pathogenesis, with regards to disease itself, and with regards to the treatment of the disease. So, because the cell wall of mycobacteria is atypical, which I'll show you later, it does have relevance to TB, it does have relevance to treatment, and it also has relevance to drug resistance. So I hope we'll be able to touch on all of those aspects today uh, uh, to uh, some depth. So, <clears throat> okay, uh, if I could say, uh, put the title in some other way, I would say, don't assume uh, the prevailing wisdom is correct. Uh, so that is, Another way of reframing what I'm going to tell you today is don't assume what you have learned or what is in the textbooks or what has been published and been the dominant uh, paradigm for a long time uh, uh, is correct all the time. And, and I did assume that when I started this research, but accidentally we found, uh, we uh, ran into observations that did not quite uh, match to what was um, it was not really published in a sense, but what was generalized from publications from other bacteria, which I will walk through uh, in, in this hour. Okay, so going back to the cell wall of uh, bacteria, so I'm showing you a bacterial rod here, mycobacterium tuberculosis looks like this, and I'm showing you the cell wall of it. Okay, so uh, a component of the cell wall itself, what is this? It's called uh, the peptidoglycan. It is the exoskeleton of bacterial cells. All bacterial cells have that. You know, it determines the shell shape and provides structural protection to cell. If it's a cocci, a round shaped cocci, the peptidoglycan is the structural component that determines this, that determines the shape of the cocci. Well, if it's a helicobacter pylori, the spiral shape is determined by the chemical composition and the way the peptidoglycan is connected uh, uh, that eventually leads the, to the spiral shape of a helicobacter, uh, helicobacter pylori. So please remember this, uh, this is the, the peptidoglycan is the structural component of the uh, cell wall. Where does it exist? It literally exists exterior to the plasma membrane. So it ends up encapsulating the entire plasma membrane. Um, 
and all bacteria have it. What are the other functions of peptidoglycan? It is necessary for cell septation during division. So there's a new peptidoglycan that is synthesized in the septum so that the uh, two daughter cells can divide. And it also anchors a lot of complex molecules, lipids and peptides that become part of the cell, um, cell wall exterior to the uh, peptidoglycan and that is exposed and interacts with the host during disease, okay? What is its relevance to human health? As I told you just now, it also anchors a lot of molecules uh, in E. coli, it anchors brown pro, uh, lipoprotein and so forth, um, uh, which is important in disease. Uh, and another way that is important in human health is its inhibition. Inhibiting peptidoglycan synthesis is lethal to bacteria. As I told you, all bacteria have this uh, structure and any way in which uh, this structure is compromised becomes lethal to bacteria. So. Uh, there are drugs, namely the beta-lactams, uh, that compromise the synthetic machinery of peptidoglycan. Uh, by doing so, uh, uh, the cells, bacterial cells, die when they are exposed to uh, uh, these antibiotics. And um, greater than 50% of antibiotics prescribed around the world today belong to the beta-lactam class or the um, uh, uh, class of molecules that inhibit peptidoglycan synthesis. So we can think about uh, there are lots and lots of different uh, uh, antibiotics uh, out there, right? Some inhibit uh, um, protein synthesis, uh, translation, some inhibit RNA polymerase activity, some inhibit uh, DNA metabolism, for example, the fluoroquinolones. There are many, many, uh, many, many other different types of uh, <clears throat> antibiotics, but there is one class that comprises 50%, more than 50% of antibiotics prescribed today, and all of those antibiotics belong to the class that inhibits peptidoglycan. That is why it's very significant, okay? And we'll, we'll get to those drugs uh, uh, shortly. And what is the peptidoglycan composed of? As the name says, it's a polymer of peptides and sugars. Um, so let's just, I just want to uh, uh, show this uh, data uh, one more time. More than 50% of antibiotics globally uh, belong to the beta-lactam class that inhibit uh, uh, peptidoglycan. On the right, I'm showing you various classes of beta-lactams and glycopeptides, vancomycin also. It inhibits uh, uh, peptidoglycan synthesis. And not only it has a, a great history in terms of treating uh, bacterial infections in humans, its use has seen increase in the last few years also. You know, it's not that newer uh, antibiotics have come into the market and into the clinic and they are being picked up and replacing uh, beta-lactams. That's not really the case. Actually, inhibition of peptidoglycan is still the major driving factor in terms of our ability to uh, cure bacterial diseases. So there is a historical model. Because of the importance of peptidoglycan in the 60s and 70s, uh, the structure of the peptidoglycan and the biosynthetic machinery was worked out using um, uh, model bacteria such as staph and E. coli and B-subtilis. These were the three uh, model uh, organisms, bacterial organisms that were used uh, to um, describe uh, what a peptidoglycan of bacteria looks like. Okay, so what all of these, uh, uh, the research using these three uh, led to was this particular model that I'm going to uh, animate to you, okay? So in the cytoplasm, the monomer of the peptidoglycan is synthesized. As you can see here, these are two sugar molecules, and there is a peptide with five amino acids, L-alanine, D-glute, mesodiaminopimelic acid, and D-alanine and D-alanine. So this molecule, I'm showing you four monomers here, is synthesized in the cytoplasm, and it's shuttle outside where there is this uh, enzyme called the DD transpeptidase. It's also known more commonly in the literature as penicillin binding protein, because that's how they were discovered. When penicillin was uh, brought into the clinic and uh, you know, uh, researchers uh, investigated what did it inhibit in order to kill bacteria, they uh, uh, found the enzyme that bound to the penicillins and they called them penicillin binding proteins. Uh, simply, it's a clinical name rather than the biochemical, uh, it doesn't reflect the biochemical function it serves in the cell itself. So, um, you know, it, PBPs and DD transpeptidases are, are used synonymously. So, <clears throat> here you have this enzyme. 
this monomer is shuttled outside, transported outside, and this in, this enzyme, basically like a DNA polymerase that synth polymerizes the uh, uh, DNA, uh, this polymerizes the peptidoglycan monomers into a giant structure. Okay, it basically staples as as these molecules arrive uh, in front of it. So I'm going to animate that for you. Okay. So how does it staple these molecules or how does this link this molecule is that it makes this, it hydrolyzes the fifth amino acid and transfers that bond from the uh, fourth amino acid to the third amino acid of the next chain. Okay, so these four, three, four, three, four, three linkages, these bridges are con uh, created uh, so that this molecule becomes a giant three-dimensional structure that surrounds the cell. And according to this molecule, there is only one enzyme that carries out this activity. Okay. These are the DD transpeptidases that synthesize the interpeptide linkages of the 4-3 type. And it is these enzymes, this enzyme class, that is inhibited by beta-lactams because the beta-lactams mimic the substrate at this end, the D-alanine and D-alanine. The structure, the chemical structure of this uh, substrate is very similar to beta-lactams or the beta-lactams uh, structures are very similar to the uh, uh, structure of the uh, dialanine dialanine which is bound by the this uh, enzyme so by mimicking the substrate itself beta lactams bind to this enzyme the cell wall cannot be formed the peptidoglycan cannot be formed as the cell is extending to the uh, grow there are the holes appear at uh, there are depressions and holes appears in the cell wall and basically the cell base uh, uh, ruptures and dies so that is the mechanism that has been established for a long time so again According to this model, there is only one enzyme class, the DD transpeptidases, that make only one kind of uh, uh, linkage, four to three linkages. Okay, so that had been the model for more than forty years, and this was the model that informed the use of uh, beta lactams in the clinic. Right. So this model, if there was anything wrong with this model, there is a chance that perhaps we were not using beta lactam molecules properly. Um, or to the fullest extent. So all these, you know, this is the structure of the beta lactam. All of the beta lactam, there are many, many classes, five different classes actually, but you'll hear of penicillin, cephalosporins, and carbapenems that were, in terms of chronology, penicillins came first around the 40s, and then around 60s, cephalosporins, and around 1780s, uh, carbapenems were developed and they entered the uh, clinic. And the carbapenems are considered stronger or more um, active um, against most of the uh, bacterial pathogens compared to cephalosporins and penicillins, although there are some exceptions to this rule. All of them have this four-membered beta-lactam ring. You can see that here in all of them, but the side chain, the side ring, and the chains, the R groups that you can see here, uh, they are different, and that's what they, um, makes these molecules different from one um, each other. So <clears throat> at some point, you know, and, and the thinking was, I'll go back to this, all of these molecules inhibit the same uh, uh, DD transpeptidase, and that's how they derive the activity, right? Um, and that's what was published based on E. coli, B. subtilis, and Staph aureus. But at some point in history, around the 1970s, gross generalization was made. And it was considered or thought that peptidoglycan of all bacteria, including mycobacteria, was cross-linked by only DD transpeptidases, and only four three linkages were made. And that architecture of peptidoglycan was conserved across all bacteria. Right? When they did this work in three organisms and found the same thing, that's the conclusion they ended up having to make. So, but around the same time, as you can see this paper in 1974, it showed that I'm going to uh, highlight this here. In uh, addition to DD, uh, D alanine and mesodiaminopimelic acid, which is the four three linkages that I showed you earlier, there are three three linkages also. The linkage between mesodiaminopimelic acid and mesodiaminopimelic acid of the two side chains in mycobacteria. So this paper said, wait a minute, the model says uh, that was taking, uh, you know, that was taking shape said there are only four three linkages. No, but in mycobacteria, in addition to four three linkages, there are three three linkages also. But because the enzyme for 3-3 linkages was not obvious and people didn't find that, the researchers uh, didn't find that, uh, this uh, particular paper sort of died from the, uh, uh, or went into the background for a long time. Then about um, 13 years later, 
In 1987, uh, a paper comes along where it says, even in E. coli, when uh, E. coli is growing slowly, the peptidoglycan composition is different. And it shows in here, I've highlighted the number of unusual diaminopimelyl, diaminopimelic acid cross breezes, which are the 3 3, which was published in 1974 that exists in mycobacterium, uh, in mycobacteria, um, was also observed in E. coli, but during slow growing phase or when they isolated by uh, E. coli at stationary phase of growth. Remember, a lot of this work was done in actively multiplying cultures and in E. coli, and the model was prepared like that, right? But they saw that there were on these three three linkages, and they called them unusual because the model said there is only four three. Uh, these cross breezes increased fivefold. Not only that, the amounts of PBP decreased. So there were hints in the literature that the model is not as robust as uh, uh, it was purported to be. So now in 2008, here's a paper showing this peptidoglycan of stationary phase mycobacterium tuberculosis predominantly cr contains cross linkages generated by LD transpeptidase, which is 3,3. So this ended up being the enzyme. I will, I will get to that uh, later. So in addition to this DD transpeptidases, also known as penicillin binding protein, which make 4,3 linkages, mycobacterium tuberculosis has this LD transpeptidase and machinery. Uh, which make these three three linkages. Not only mycobacterium tuberculosis, uh, atypical mycobacteria such as mycobacterium abscessus is also predominantly cross-linked with three three linkages. So now you might think, oh, maybe this is something very unique about mycobacterium tuberculosis, and other bacteria don't have it. There we go. Clostridium difficile (CDF). Also, its peptidoglycan is predominantly. Uh, it's unusual since it mainly contains these three three linkages. So. Uh, the old paradigm has been uh, broken, and, and, and the composition of the peptidoglycan described in the old paradigm, and that is still widely taught around the world, is incorrect, and that needs an update. So here is the classical model again, based on the historical uh, data, that there's only one enzyme, this blue guy here, DG transpeptidase, that makes this peptidoglycan by making these four three linkages. This is incorrect and needs to be thrown away. So now this is the revised model. Um, I'm just showing you uh, uh, without data, I'm just giving you the conclusions here and I'll get to the data soon. Uh, so here is the 4-3 uh, uh, linkage generating DD transpeptidase. Uh, in addition to this enzyme, there's also another enzyme I'm showing you on the right uh, that makes these 3-3 three, three linkages, okay? So uh, this is uh, take home message number one. Bacterial peptidoglycan, the target of beta-lactams, beta is cross-linked with at least two dis distinct linkages, 4-3 and 3-3. The 3-3 are made by LD transpeptidases, and the classical linkages, the 4-3 are made by DD transpeptidases. I hope this message is clear. <laughs> so here is the hard evidence now. Uh, let's look at mycobacterium tuberculosis. This is an uh, um, uh, image of a rabbit that was infected with mycobacterium tuberculosis, and you can see all these lesions, nodules that are very typical of uh, um, caseating necrosis in um, humans also. Usually in humans, there is one large node in the uh, upper lobe, lobe of lungs, and here uh, this is a cartoon um, of uh, airport in the U.S. Uh, where uh, the transport uh, officer is uh, uh, scanning people arriving from uh, uh, foreign countries, and they're basically being put through x-ray, and they're looking for these nodes in the lung, right? And, and saying like, does this person have uh, TB or not? TB or not TB? There goes Shakespeare. And, you know, they're basically trying to screen to make sure that people are not bringing uh, uh, um, drug-resistant or incurable TB. Uh, if they are, they would be uh, given treatment at this stage. Uh, so which we sort of now can relate with the COVID situation here, right? I mean, you know, hardly we can go to the airport. If we do, there are ways of screening people nowadays. Uh, so infectious disease is, 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 is quite uh, uh, relevant in this uh, current situation is quite relevant in, in our own context of TB. So <clears throat> now let's do some basic science here. In 1998, a group uh, led by Cole um, et al. Uh, published this paper in uh, uh, with the sequence of mycobacterium tuberculosis, and they demonstrated that this 4.4 MB uh, circular genome encoded for around 4,400 uh, uh, genes. 
So we asked a very simple question, very unbiased questions. There are 4,400 genes. Which genes are essential for bacteria to survive, be viable, and cause disease? Because the bacteria has to be viable before it can cause disease. So we thought if we could identify these essential gene set or essential proteins that mycobacterium tuberculosis needs to be viable, survive, and cause disease, maybe we can find new targets, new proteins that have not been uh, targeted by current drugs and make drugs against those targets. So <clears throat> we, using transposon metagenesis, we um, randomly mutated as many genes as possible uh, and uh, uh, picked them one at a time. So this is what wild-time mycobacterium tuberculosis looks like on an auger plate, okay? It grows very diffusely laterally and it's dull looking, almost like a, you know, a suburban sprawl, uh, like whole town kind of uh, uh, architecture, okay? Uh, very disorganized, uh, flat lateral sprawl, okay? But we, uh, we saw one mutant, this mutant lacks gene X, gene of unknown function. Instead of growing laterally in a disorganized way, it looks more like noida, it, these are, you know, this uh, mutant uh, grows aerially, it's very shiny and just grows aerially out of the auger plate. Uh, those of you who've been to Noida or any downtown big city in uh, India would have these skyscrapers coming out of nowhere, right? And, and so it just looks like that. So what we know so far is this colony morphology switch from this wild type looking to this particular phenotype uh, where uh, due to lack of a particular gene that whose function was unknown. So we went a little bit further and looked at the uh, at the cellular level, not at the colony level, but at the cellular level. This is what wild type uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis looks like on any scanning EM, nice rod shaped, you know, very virulent organism. This is what it looks like. And the mutant, that particular mutant that grows out of the cell, out of the agar, uh, looks like this. You know, it uh, it is highly deformed, has these depressions, and uh, these uh, septal rings uh, are very prominent, and some of them are busted open. So uh, you, what we can see here is lack of this particular gene leads to a morphology not only at the colony uh, level but also at the cellular level. Um, so this is all you know, uh, uh, in vitro morphology, and does this have any relevance to disease? Does this gene uh, uh, make any difference to mycobacterium tuberculosis's virulence? So we tested the mutant wild type and the complemented, we generated a complemented strain. We infected mice, 12 mice in each group with the same dose of each bacteria. So three groups of mice, 12 each, received either wild type, mutant, mutant that lacks this gene X, that particular mutant, and the complemented strain. And this is just a survival curve. And as you can see here, mice that received wild type and complemented strain died as expected. These are control groups. But mice that received mutant at the same dose survived six months. And at that time, we stopped the experiment because we were not collecting any data. So what does this tell us? This tells us that this particular gene and the protein that it encodes is essential for virulence of mycobacterium tuberculosis for it to cause disease. These mice were disease free. They were getting fat, they were get, they were perfectly normal, gaining weight, no, no disease whatsoever. By the way, this work was published in 2010 and um, I had the pleasure of hosting Radhika Gupta in my lab and she's the first author of this particular paper and all of the data is uh, already there. So, uh, so now, if we can inhibit this particular enzyme in a human, uh, in mycobacterium tuberculosis infected human, we would be able to revert from disease like this with mortality to no disease, right? So this particular evidence told us that inhibition of X, this protein X in vivo, would have a clinical utility in transforming from mortality, morbidity and mortality to no disease and no mortality. Okay. So what is this gene? What protein does this gene encode? What do we know about this particular protein? So we looked at uh, various domains and what we found was uh, this particular paper, okay? This particular, uh, when we did the domain searches, uh, it led us to this particular paper. Uh, this paper uh, reported uh, identification of uh, uh, an enzyme uh, 
in a beta lactam resistant uh, organism, and they were working with uh, beta lactam resistant enterococci, and that's where they found this particular enzyme. So this uh, beta lactam resistant enterococci, they were these researchers were looking for what is the mechanism for beta lactam resistance in this particular enterococci. It was not beta lactam, is they knew that. So they they asked a very simple question: beta lactams inhibit penicillin binding proteins or DD transpeptidases that make the four three linkages. So they looked, they looked into this particular uh, organism, this uh, uh, strain, and found that the PPPs were not mutated. They were present and they were being expressed. Uh, but they didn't find these linkages. The bacteria was not making 4-3 linkages. Instead, it was making these 3-3 linkages, as you can see here. Um, sorry. They were making this. Uh, this bulb was making three to three linkages. It was not connecting from the fourth amino acid to the third amino acid, although it had PVPs. It was linking the third amino acid to third amino acid and making these bridges and synthesizing the peptidoglycan. And they found the enzyme and they called it LD transpeptidase. So why is it relevant to our work? So we took the um, enzyme called LD transpeptidase of Enterococcus fasciam, the FM here. The C terminal end has the catalytic site. That C terminal end uh, has a match with the C terminal of, our, of the protein encoded by our gene X. So the protein X in our mutant the, at the C terminal end has a domain which looks very similar sequence wise to the catalytic domain of this uh, LD transpected peptidase in Enterococcus fasciam, which leads to resistance to beta lactams and by way of generating 3 3 linkages. So we asked a very simple question by analogy. Does our protein also, in this previously unknown protein, uh, also make 3 3 linkages in uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis? Remember, the existence of 3 3 linkages we already know. It's just the protein was not known, the enzyme was not known. So we expressed this in E. coli, purified, and uh, did a cross linking assay with the uh, monomers itself. And as you can see here from this mass spec uh, spectrogram, uh, indeed, this particular uh, protein, which is now an enzyme, was uh, able to link um, uh, the third amino acid to third amino acid. So, which uh, allowed us to provide evidence that this is the enzyme, this is the elusive enzyme that makes these three, three linkages and uh, in mycobacterium tuberculosis. So, uh, this X we ended up naming LD transpeptidase in mycobacterium tuberculosis. Okay. So, although the linkages were known, the existence of linkages was known, people thought. These I'm showing you PBPs or the DD transpeptidases on right, PONA1 and PBP of mycobacterium tuberculosis. People thought perhaps these 3 3 cross linking enzymes are related to these 4 3 cross linking enzymes, and they use their sequence to find other enzymes that were similar uh, that might make 3 3 linkages, and they never found it. Why? Because they're evolutionarily completely unrelated. So I'm showing you LD transpeptidases two LD transpeptidases from mycobacterium tuberculosis. There are five of them in mycobacterium tuberculosis. We cloned, uh, expressed these, and crystallized in our own lab and solved the crystal structure here by uh, a very talented postdoc, um, Pankas Kumar. Um, <clears throat> so, here are the crystal structures of um, LD transpeptidases, and here are the crystal structures of uh, PVPs in mycobacterium tuberculosis. And they are completely unrelated. You cannot tell the sequence. We cannot find the sequence, use the sequence of one as an anchor to find another one. As you can see from the structure also, they are completely different. This is a serine-based enzyme, the penicillin binding proteins, proteins. as opposed to that, the LD transpeptidases are uh, cysteine-based enzymes. But it is a perfect example of unre evolutionarily unrelated enzymes, but a functional convergence. They do very similar function in the sense they make these cross linkages. Right, with using very similar substrate. This guy uses the DD transfer, DD, DLA, DLA, fourth and fifth amino acids as a substrate. He uses the MDAP DLA. So again, transpeptidation reaction is very similar to, uh, for both of them. So, <clears throat> having said that, what we know with regards to the penicillin binding proteins is they bind these beta lactams. They, 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 they are bound by penicillins, cephalosporins, and carbapenems. So, we ask the question now. We, we have this new enzyme class, LD transpeptidase. Do LD transpeptidases also bind, or do beta lactams also bind to LD uh, transpeptidases? So we did this assay. In order to do this assay, we uh, 
expressed in purified LD transpeptidases, two LD transpeptidases from Mycobacterium tuberculosis, one and two, I'm showing you here on the left, and also from Mycobacterium abscessus, okay, this is another mycobacteria, fast growing, which I'll get to a little bit more later. Um, um, and uh, it also has five of these uh, LD transpeptidases, and we purified two of them. And not only in mycobacteria, in gram negatives and gram positives, I'm showing here you uh, Klebsiella, uh, pneumonia, uh, cloacae, and Pseudomonas aeruginosa. They also have LD transpeptidases. So now other people are finding that these LD transpeptidases are present in a wide variety of bacteria, and this mechanism is present not, not only in mycobacterium tubers, tuberculosis or other mycobacteria where it's dominant, but also present in other bacteria. <coughs> and important at different stages of growth. Okay, so the question we asked was, do different classes of beta-lactams bind to LD transpeptidases? So we did this assay, we incubated LD transpeptidase, ALD transpeptidase with, let's say a penicillin, amoxicillin, and if they bind, and, and there's a complex form, we are able to see an adduct, uh, there will be a plus whatever molecular mass in. If, if it says no adduct, that means it did not bind and form a covalent adduct, right? So. For most of the LD transpeptidase, we were unable to see a uh, binding of penicillins to this class of enzyme. Now that we move on to the cephalosporins. I'm showing you uh, an example here, cephalo cephalothin. Uh, you, you start to see more hits, you know, more of the cephalosporins uh, bind to, um, they bind to LD transpeptidase. It's, then we look at carbapenems and penems here, doripenem and farapenem, I'm showing you as examples. Uh, all of them, pretty much all of them are able to bind to LD transpeptidases. So now we did, next we did a very simple experiment here where we mixed equimolar amount of amoxicillin from penicillin, cephalosporin representing, uh, uh, cephalothin representing uh, 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 cephalosporin, estrinam representing monobactam, and farapenem uh, representing uh, carbapenem or the penem class. So we have equimolar amount, then we added um, each of these enzyme, and basically we're asking for which class of uh, beta-lactam binds to the LD transpeptidases, right? And invariably, we only see carapenems or penem binding to them. So what this told us was, allowed us to conclude was, it's actually the uh, carapenems that bind and inhibit LD transpeptidases. Again, I will uh, go back to the second slide I uh, showed you, maybe the third slide. Uh, it's the carbapenems are the most recent class of beta-lactams, and they are far more powerful against many bacteria than penicillins and cephalosporins. In the United States, if there is carbapenem resistance, it is reportable to CDC because it's an urgent matter. That's the last line of defense. If carbapenems cannot be used to treat uh, certain bacterial infections, we do not have anything else. Most of these patients will end up dying, right? Uh, so. Um, and they are very potent against a wide range of bacteria compared to older beta-lactams. So now what we know is, aha, the potency was thought that they bound strongly or much more strongly in inhibited DD transpeptidases. But that was not really the case. You know, that was not the only cases. So what we know now is, again, this work has also been published uh, in 2017. So the take-home message here, the second take-home message uh, today is the carbapenems work against bacteria not only because they inhibit DDTs, that was uh, uh, considered like they're strong inhibitors of DDTs or PVPs, or they are resistant to beta-lactamases. There, there was a thought that uh, carapenems are more resistant to beta-lactamases that chew other beta-lactams. Uh, but that, those are not the only two reasons, not the only reasons, but because they also inhibit LDTs. That's how they derive their potent activity compared to other beta-lactams, okay? Other beta-lactams do not effectively inhibit these LDTs, which were previously unknown. So now, let's bust another myth today. Uh, so the classical model again, as I told you earlier, um, there are various beta-lactam classes. They all inhibit uh, the penicillin binding protein or DD transpeptidases. And depending on their structure and depending on the uh, penicillin binding protein of the organism uh, of interest. Their binding uh, efficiency may be different, and, and uh, which translates to the potency of the um, drug. That's what, that was what the classical model said. And based on this model, clinicians were taught to use, they're still in many universities, they're taught to use only one beta-lactam at a time. 
because there is only one enzyme to be inhibited. If you use two beta lactams, it would be redundant because there is only one enzyme class. Actually, if you, if you go and ask a doctor, can you give me two beta lactams at the same time? Most of the doctor will say no, because that's not what the textbook says. Okay, and we will uh, bust that myth uh, now. What we know now is this model is incorrect, right? Because the fundamental science itself was incorrect. As it said, there's only one enzyme. Now we know, no, there's in addition to this uh, classical enzyme, there's also this new enzyme, or this is really not new enzyme, newly discovered enzyme, it was already there. So there are two classes of enzymes. So what we also know, and this, this work is published not only by our lab, but many uh, uh, other labs also, that penicillins are very good at inhibiting uh, uh, DD transpeptidases, but very poor at inhibiting the LD transpeptidases. So let's say you have an infection where LD transpeptidases are uh, heavily expressed. Actually, in that 1978 paper, if you look there, the patient becomes resistant to or tolerant and resistant to beta lactam because the patient has a catheter and the E. coli infection is now not treatable with uh, uh, beta lactam because they looked and the, it was expressing more of 3 3 linkages, right? So if you have, uh, if your organism is now switched to 3 3 linkages or to this particular enzyme, then insulins are not going to be effective. Those evidences was already there long ago, but the explanation wasn't there because the enzyme was not discovered. Now, if you move to cephalosporins, they are pretty good at inhibiting DD transpeptidases, and they're better than penicillins are inhibiting LD transpeptidases, but not as quite uh, good as carbapenems, which are good at inhibiting both of them and particularly good at inhibiting LD transpeptidases. Now, we have these two enzyme classes and uh, beta lactams with differential inhibitory potencies against this enzyme. So we asked a very simple question, simple hypothesis. Can we combine beta lactams? Can combinations of beta lactams that differentially inhibit LD transpeptidases and DD transpeptidases, these two enzyme class, and optimally inhibit, exhibit synergy in killing bacteria? So we, for that, we switched to mycobacterium abscesses. This is a rapidly growing environmental mycobacterium. And it is an emerging pathogen. And by the time, you know, we, we, we discovered this enzyme in uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis and, and published in 2010, by the time we were doing this work, uh, this translational work in 2015 or so, uh, mycobacterium abscesses uh, incidence in the U.S. was greater than, now it's greater than tuberculosis. Actually, mycobacterium abscesses is a bigger, bigger disease in the U.S. than TB. So there was a lot of emphasis on it, and we decided to work on this new uh, uh, pathogen that was ignored for a long, long time. It causes pulmonary infections, very similar to TB, and actually there's a paper out of India where it's, uh, the, the authors demonstrated that it's commonly misdiagnosed, these antium infections, mycobacterium ab abscesses infections are commonly misdiagnosed. Um, and as you can see here in certain population in the U.S., uh, uh, the mycobacterium abscesses is, is the predominantly uh, detected uh, organism uh, from the lung, lung um, uh, samples. And its incidence is increasing because it's a fast-growing organism. And BSL2, we were, we thought we'd be able to uh, focus on this organism and get some data out pretty quickly. So, with regards to the treatment of mycobacterium abscesses, it's much more difficult than tuberculosis in terms of treatment. As you can see here, there is an initial phase of uh, treating with uh, a combination of drugs, and then there is a continuation phase. And the duration is longer than normally that, uh, that is used for treatment of tuberculosis. And even with these combinations, which none of these drugs have, have gone through clinical trial. Uh, so these are all repurposed drugs based on clinical experience of doctors, right? So there, there is no regimen that has been developed based on a controlled clinical trial. It's just experience or likeness of a particular uh, doctor for, for these drugs. So even with these uh, the drugs, uh, the sputum culture conversion rate for mycobacterium abscesses disease is 25 to 40 percent only. And now this makes tuberculosis a very simpler disease to treat. And many of these antibiotics that are used, uh, for, for example, tigacycline, emicacin, uh, have uh, uh, very uh, uh, severe side effects. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, work needs, uh, that needs to be done on in this particular organism. Here I'm showing you a slide where in addition to mycobacterium abscess, uh, mycobacterium abscesses, where I'm here is one LD transpeptidase, another LD transpeptidase, another LD transpeptidase. There are five of these. 
not only Mycobacterium abscessus, uh, Mycobacterium avium, this work was done by Rohini Matu, and she also that in addition to Mycobacterium abscessus, another environmental bacteria, Mycobacterium avium, rapidly growing or uh, moderately rapidly growing, it also has this LD transpeptidases, um, <clears throat> and they are expressed in very high uh, amounts. So, going back to this slide, if there are two enzymes, can we think of a hypothesis where we can we combine two different beta lactams and test the hypothesis that perhaps there is a combination that optimally inhibits inhibits it better than it's inhibiting uh, one uh, a DD transpeptidase, the combination of two beta lactams, and can they bring synergy in killing Mycobacterium abscessus? So this work was done by uh, Liz Story Rollers. She was a clinical fellow, and she wanted to. Uh, she was interested in translating our basic findings, and she came to our lab and um, made uh, more than 200 combinations here. The, all these drugs on the left, these are beta lactams, okay, from cephalosporin and, and, and uh, carbapenems, and the, the lower ones here are just controls. So, what does this particular dot here mean? Uh, this dark uh, blue shaded means synergy. So what does this mean? Two beta lactams here, cefdetorin uh, and C, which is cefuroxim. Both of them are cephalosporins, or down here, imipenem and cefuroxim. When you combine them in amounts that are much less than their MICs, we're talking about one fourth or one eighth, some even you know one sixteenth of MIC of two of these drugs, their potency is equal to or better than a full dose of either of those drugs. So now if you combine much smaller amount of two drugs, they uh, result in activity in killing Mycobacterium abscesses. Uh, they are more potent than full dose of either of those drugs, okay? That was completely unheard of before. So a lot of combinations don't have synergy, but as you can see here, 13 combinations of two bacteria, two beta-lactam without beta-lactam is inhibitor, which is from the textbooks uh, from the past, the model doesn't permit this because the model was incorrect. So now this was an in vitro uh, uh, work, right? This is a synergy test using uh, uh, plate assay. Uh, so what we see in vitro, can we, is that uh, synergy also preserved in vivo in an animal model of disease or in humans, right? So do dual beta lactams, combination of two beta lactams, also exhibit synergy in vivo. Can we use two beta lactams at the same time to treat uh, mycobacterial diseases better than using one beta lactam? So we tested that. In order to test this, there was not a, we didn't have a good model, animal model of mycobacterium inf uh, abscessus infection. A desirable model would allow aerosol infection uh, <clears throat> um, by the natural route and would grow. Uh, uh, in bacterial burden over time in the lungs um, of the uh, organ uh, of the host. So uh, we chose to uh, work on C3 HEB mice because it develops uh, defined lesions and caseating, caseating granulomas that are similar to uh, uh, that seen in tuberculosis. So this particular mouse strain had already been developed to mimic TB in, in humans. So uh, what we did was this particular mouse uh, strain is able to clear mycobacterium abscesses uh, if you just give mycobacterium abscesses uh, without suppressing its immune system. But there was one solution. Uh, there was a Cornell model, which I will show you later in the next slide. In the Cornell model, what happens is you treat, you, in, you treat um, mice that are infected with mycobacterium tuberculosis with an antibiotic regimen for a defined period of time. And, you saw that the lungs are sterilized. There's no more mycobacterium tuberculosis. The uh, mice have been treated uh, uh, and be cured of uh, TB. But actually, if you wait for a long time, you are able to detect um, reactivation of TB. And so this uh, uh, scientist at Cornell asked, what is happening? There must be organisms that are, cannot be killed, but at a later time point, after the treatment is discontinued, they are able to grow back. So what they did was, rather than wait for a long time, they uh, administered corticosteroid immediately after completion of treatment to reactivate or to suppress the immune system so that the bacteria can grow. And they were able to show that, yes, indeed, you, are, you can see reactivation of tuberculosis much more quickly. So we thought 
we could use corticosteroid treatment, but at an earlier phase. So give a corticosteroid treatment, dexamethasone, early on, then infect with mycobacterium abscesses. Otherwise, mycobacterium abscesses is clear. Then see what happens. And indeed, after a lot of uh, uh, trial and error, we were able to develop this model where if you give dexamethasone early on and continue, uh, and then infect with mycobacterium abscesses, mice are able to uh, maintain mycobacterium abscesses infection. And here I'm showing you this work was done by Emily in the lab. She was a grad student. And uh, you infect with a moderate dose of mycobacterium abscesses and with dexamethasone, five milligram per kilo uh, per day, um, um, each day, um, you are able to see, we were able to see mycobacterium abscesses uh, growth uh, uh, occur and maintain over the course of the treatment. So now this is what the disease looks like. You know, you need to administer this corticosteroid and this is mycobacterium abscesses causing this giant lesion, okay? Uh, and if you keep, uh, leave these mice uh, for a long period of time, they eventually end up dying. So now here, c 3 hb this mouse strain, if they receive corticosteroid treatment, abscesses burden increases. Even in nude mice or c 3 hb mice that are not treated with corticosteroid, the mice are able to eventually clear. But we needed a mouse model that was able to sustain infection for a long time so that, and have produced the disease. So all, this mouse model was also uh, uh, published last year. So we uh, um, uh, demonstrated the pathology uh, uh, during the course of the disease and how it responds to uh, uh, treatment. Um, so once we have the disease model, we are able to ask the question, if there's an experimental drug or, or uh, a, a regimen, can it be used to treat this particular disease? So that's what we did next. Um, so again, I think I have this extra slide here, you can change the uh, dose of the corticosteroid here, either cortisone or dexamethasone. If you use mild dose, a mid dose or high dose, the level of disease also changes. You use high dose of cortisone, that means you are or corticosteroid, either dex or cortisone, you suppress the immune system correspondingly and you can have a disease occur more quickly and more severe um, depending on the amount of uh, um, drug, um, uh, dexamethasone or cortic uh, cortisone that you use. And again, we were able to show the, uh, immune um, pathology that is uh, commonly observed in human patients. And we can clearly see AFB bacilli here, uh, 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 mycobacterium abscesses and the lesion, and all of this work has uh, been um, demonstrated, uh, uh, published in paper last year. What we also saw, what is quite different from mycobacterium tuberculosis, was we put uh, eight different strains through mice, and we see a lot of heterogeneity. Unlike mycobacterium tuberculosis, which are, if you were to collect eight different strains from different parts of the world and put it through mice, you know, their growth pattern in the mice is very similar. Mycobacterium abscesses is very, very heterogeneous disease, okay? The strains are very, very heterogeneous, and we were very surprised to see that. So now, now that we have this model, what we did was, we infected mice uh, with mycobacterium abscesses, and one group of mice was untreated. And as you can see this uh, black line here, mice that were not treated with drugs, they, uh, the bacterial burden increased as expected. Then we had another group where uh, three different groups, one group was treated with a <clears throat> full dose of imipenem here. Okay, this is a drug that is used to treat mycobacterium abscesses uh, infection. When you treat with 200 milligram per kilo, you see a, a, a decline as expected. Another group was treated with a full dose of ceftinir. It doesn't do much. It's very similar to control, okay? Now, the fourth group, this is the test group, was treated with half dose of imipenem and ceftinir. Half the dose of imipenem and half the dose of ceftinir. And as you can see here, it produces comparable or even better efficacy uh, um, compared to the full dose of imipenem or full dose of septinid. Again, this allowed us to show synergy. You combine half the amount of drug of either of those drugs, uh, which the old model would say would not be efficacious. It's not only not efficacious, it has shows better efficacy than uh, either of those drugs alone. And we published this work in 2019, and we also saw that the selection of resistant mutants is much lower when you use two drugs compared to one of those drugs. So now, improved efficacy in terms of reducing the bacterial burden, and also in terms of um, lowering the uh, selection of resistant mutants. 
Okay. Uh, that was not the only drug that we tested. Here is imipenem and doripenem, both carbapenems. The combination works better than either a full dose of either of those drugs. Again, we saw this with imipenem and biopenem. Same thing we see here. Okay, so this work uh, was again published in 2019. So I'm ne nearing the end of my slide, uh, my presentation here. Uh, so mycobacterium abscesses, um, uh, the, it's listened to beta lactams. You know, the relevance of having this atypical uh, cell wall is uh, uh, the fact that it is synthesized by two different enzymes. Uh, and the fact that two different enzymes are differentially inhibited by beta lactams, there is an um, uh, there is an opportunity that has not been realized before in terms of repurposing beta lactams, combining two different beta lactams in treating mycobacterium abscesses, and in uh, 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 treating other mycobacterial disease also. So we published these three paper uh, showing uh, at various uh, in vitro and in vivo. Um, using in vivo and in, in vitro models to demonstrate the utility of using beta lactams. Uh, it's not only in uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis, actually. Uh, there's a paper that came out in 2019 after our work uh, that there was a comparable efficacy and better safety, better safety, tolerability of double beta lactam combination therapy as compared to beta lactam and aminoglycoside, which is the standard care of treatment for gram negative bacteria in a randomized control trial. So now they're saying like, wait, we were using beta lactam plus aminoglycoside. That is the clinical uh, recommendation for treating various gram-negative bacterial uh, infections. But now we're finding not only comparable efficacy, but better safety with double beta lactams, which was again, uh, not permitted in the old model. So uh, I will rest my uh, uh, case here. Uh, hopefully you, uh, I was able to provide um, uh, data at some level. I didn't want to go very uh, uh, detailed. Um, perhaps this is um, uh, new and, 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 and not bore you with uh, technical details here, but I'm very happy to share our papers with you, or if you have any emails uh, with regards to uh, specific questions, uh, I'm ha happy to provide answers to those. Um, uh, just would like to thank my uh, lab, uh, Liz, uh, Emily, Rohini, Pankas and Christos, who did bulk of the work. I might have forgotten a few members. <laughs> uh, my collaborators here at Hopkins, Craig and uh, Nikki. Uh, my external collaborators, uh, Randy, Joel, and Steve, uh, that were involved at uh, various levels uh, uh, in our work and, uh, and our funding sources. Thank you so much. I'm happy to take questions now. Thank you very much uh, for very informative talk on, uh, you know, this deadly uh, bacterium. So I request here is uh, to the audience to, you can write your questions in the chat box. And I have already received a few questions, which if Jan allows, may I ask a few questions on the base, uh, I mean, which I have received from the audience. Sure, yeah, absolutely, Sachin, please. Yeah, so this is one question. What is the effect of LD trans 50 days inhibitors on latent MTB infection and on drug resistance, things like MDR and XDR as well? Uh, that's a great question, actually. Um, uh, based on our work, partly based on our work, other people have also contributed now. Uh, a clinical trial has been initiated in South Africa to study the effect of uh, combining beta lactams uh, for treatment of TB. Uh, we do not have any uh, clinical trial, or I do not know of uh, uh, models that have specifically, uh, lab mo models that have specifically looked at uh, uh, treatment of latent TB with uh, uh, dual beta lactam. We don't know that. The jury is out. I think because this work is so new, uh, I think it will take some time before. Uh, those particular uh, uh, questions are brought to the lab or a uh, clinical trial is conducted on, on those aspects. Uh, with regards to drug resistant bacteria, that's actually a paper uh, uh, that came out, uh, Kira Cohen is the first author of that paper, where uh, she demonstrated, again, using strains, uh, this work was uh, done in South Africa uh, using South African uh, TB strains that there is a collateral sensitivity. If there is MDR strain 
or XCR strain for reasons that we do not understand. The mechanism is, uh, is unknown yet, but they are more sensitive to beta lactams or the beta lactam MIC against those strains are lower. So for some reason, if they start collecting resistance to rifampicin, isoniazid, pyrazinamide, what have you, moxifloxacin, they end up have being more susceptible to beta lactams. That work is already out there. But uh, is there a push to treat, uh, push to use beta lactams to treat uh, MDR, XDR cases? Uh, not in mass scale. Actually, it hasn't gone up to the level of recommendation, but I will uh, uh, I refer you to a paper by Amanda Keener, her name is K-E-E-N-E-R. This came out in Nature Medicine. I'm happy to send, uh, just email me. I'm happy to send that paper. It's, uh, it's the title is goes something like uh, 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 old, draw, old dog, new trick, uh, or combining beta lactams to treat uh, um, XDR-TB. So she's a doctor in Brussels in Europe, uh, and she has this um, migrant uh, patients who, with uh, uh, difficult to treat uh, TB, uh, MDR, XDR. And uh, she gives it a try with uh, amoxicillin and meropenem, amoxclav and meropenem, and she says she has a success rate of 80%. Uh, so that's published in um, uh, Nature Medicine. And uh, after that, there are various groups that have just, without clinical trial, they've started using this. But a clinical trial has not been conducted where beta lactams have been combined in a regimen to treat XDR or MDR. But there is emerging evidence, and if you uh, look at the literature, indeed, uh, that is the case. Okay, thank you. So, uh, uh, next question is, uh, uh, how did you differentiate the mutants from the wild types? I understand this is a very basic question, but, uh, but you know, uh, lots of audience from non tv background. Oh, absolutely. So, uh, that's a great question. Again, uh, uh, the mutant, uh, I'm, refer I'm assuming that you ref uh, you're referring to the mutant that was growing aerially, right? So, like, how is this a mutant compared to the wild type? So, the for the gene to be disrupted or deleted, let's say, the gene function to be lost, we are uh, inserting a transposon that carries a marker. It actually carries a canamycin resistance gene. So, only the mutant is resistant to canamycin. Okay, so we put uh, we select these mutants on plate containing canamycin. That is the first level of evidence that these are mutants that are not wild type. Second, we sequence the entire genome. Okay, we sequence the the site of uh, we 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 sequence the genome to ensure that we can uh, demonstrate with uh, DNA sequence that this is a mutant. We can show the sequence of the transposon inserted at a site. So for all these mutants, we created about four thousand. Uh, uh, mutants and deposited all of them at ATCC. So if you want, you can directly order this from ATCC in the US. Uh, um, all of them have been sequenced and we know precisely where the mutation is and, and what the gene that is mutated and, and function aggregated. Okay. Uh, another question is, is it possible to have both DDT and LDT in single microbacterium cell? That is possible oh, to be a heterogeneous cell wall? Yes, it actually, mycobacterium tuberculosis uses both um, at all times. It just depending on the environmental stress, growth phase, the stoichiometry, which what amount of which enzyme and what link is mycobacterium adjust depending on its need. So if there is a particular stress that hits, let's say, a DD transpeptidase, it can totally survive with LD transpeptidase, right? So it can titrate the levels of two. That's what we are seeing. And it can remodel. It remodels its, its cell wall. Um, but both are expressed uh, in no, under normal circumstances. And in continuation, does mycobacterium with LDT get emerged and selected because of use of older versions of beta lactams like penicillium and cephalosporin? Uh, that's a good question because historically beta lactams were not used for treatment of TB. Again, long ago, uh, when uh, beta lactams were tested against TB, what were the beta lactams? It was penicillins. They didn't work. And then came the cephalosporins. They also tried that. They didn't work. Again, you know, hint, it's the LD transpeptidase that didn't permit. One of the reasons was LD transpeptidase that didn't permit uh, uh, these uh, older carb uh, beta lactams. Uh, 
uh, they didn't permit the activity of these uh, old, older beta lactams. But by the time the carbapenems were developed, the, the thought in the field was any beta lactam would not be effective against TB because it has this beta lactamase or it just is not porous for uh, uh, sufficiently uh, uh, porous for beta lactams to be active. Uh, so beta lactams were sort of discounted. And actually, there's a 2009 science paper from John Blanchard's lab in Albert Einstein University uh, College of Medicine that showed meropenem works. Uh, meropenem alone works against uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis. Um, so. Uh, Indeed, uh, if, but because beta lactams were not used, nothing could be selected against beta lactams, right? So I think if you were to go and use, uh, start using beta lactams, or even in a laboratory, if you start using certain beta lactams, then I would be surprised if we do not see some involvement of LB transpeptidase in terms of resisting the traditional beta lactams. Okay, and if, if you allow, uh, I would like to ask, you know, in especially in current times when, when COVID pandemics are going on, how many mutants of TB till date are known and what is the frequency of these mutations? And what are the major factor of these mutations? Um, well, that's a very broad question and I'll try I to know, see if I can answer that. Uh, well, there are, you know, again, uh, the source of mutation, let me go back and ask, answer your last question first. The source of mutation always invariably, depending on the literature, is the DNA polymerase uh, error activity, right? As it replicates the genome, there is error rate of 10 to the 8, 10 to the 7 to 10 to the 8, right? So um, every few mycobacteria is going to have one single nucleotide polymorphism. And if that SNP happens to be a missense mutation in a uh, enzyme in a gene that encodes an enzyme that is a target of a particular drug that has been that is used for treating TB. Let's say uh, rifampicin or rifamycins that are uh, that target RPOB. If the mutation happens to be there, then you end up selecting them, right? If the uh, mutation happens to be in, um, um, let's say, uh, gyrases, then um, fluoroquinolones will select that. You know, uh, uh, if uh, so, the source is the error-prone activity of the polymerase. Now, it's the use or perhaps not proper use of, uh, of drugs, right? If, you, if somebody is being treated with monotherapy or a lower dose of, uh, of uh, these uh, drugs that are used to treat TB, then the selection chances are higher. That has been demonstrated by, uh, by multiple studies, right? Uh, so, Indeed, suboptimal therapy leads to higher resistance. Uh, uh, wrong uses of drug, if, if they, you know, without testing for drug resistant, you know, if, if it's if if a strain is already resistant to rifampicin, let's say, or isoniazid, and you add that, and you the third there is only one drug, in addition to rifampicin and isoniazid, uh, you only add one drug. Basically, it's a monotherapy, right? Then you increase the uh, chances of uh, seeing resistance. So those are the particular factors. I don't remember off the top of my head what is the uh, uh, resistance numbers. Uh, I think it depends on uh, reasons and the type of uh, uh, resumes, the combinations of drugs that are used. And, and it's very relevant in, in today's context. You mentioned COVID. Uh, a lot of people don't have access to these drugs uh, simply because of shutdown of uh, uh, sources that uh, supply these drugs, right? And and I would be surprised if there is not a change in terms of drug resistance profile uh, when this COVID situation is over and when we can start uh, uh, monitoring the strains again. I think somebody was asking me about uh, uh, animal models, uh, Dr. Alok Kumar Singh. I, I see some, some uh, activity in the chat. Sachin, can you see those questions? Um, yes, so the question is, uh, uh, the animal model is good in, in uh, is to go to study pathology? Yeah, that's, that's a good, yeah, I, I saw this, Dr. Uh, Mridul Mohan says, is yes. microbiome abscesses animal model 
or I'm assuming he's referring to the our mouse model, good to, uh, to study pathology and immunology or both. I would say with regards to uh, immunology, the immune response is very artificial here. And I don't think our model is good enough to study immune response. Although if you look at our paper, the immune infiltrates, the homing in of the B cells, T cells, or neutrophils and so forth, um, are similar to that in, uh, and, and the, 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 the fibrosis, there is uh, uh, different types of staining to look at the uh, fibrosis uh, that eventually occurs. But it does mimic uh, um, the human situation, um, human pathology. But again, we're creating a slightly artificial environment here by using dexamethasone, right? So the immune system is already compromised. So I would not recommend using our model to study the immune uh, immunology uh, during mycobacterium abscesses infection because we are compromising the immune system. But with regards to pathology, again, Yes, it shows pathology, but again, the pathology is a result of immune response. Part of it is result of immune response. Part of it is could be just bacterial uh, uh, growth that is uh, um, uh, causing the tissue lesions and so forth. But I, I don't think the our model is directed towards uh, uh, a proper uh, looking at proper immune response or immune response uh, in humans. Our model is more so, can we get the disease, can we get the bacterial numbers increasing, can we get the similar lesions uh, so that a new therapeutic or experimental therapeutics can be tested? Uh, I think our model is good for that, but not as good for looking at um, immune or pathology. Okay, does, does any role of LDT in quorum sensing, because smooth and rough pollen is reported due to quorum sensing in MTB? That's a good question. I had not heard of it and not thought of it. So I, I will say thank you for the question. I do not have an answer. Uh, again, you know, uh, when there is something new discovered, there is lots of questions and I do not have an answer and hopefully somebody will pick up on that. Yes, so uh, uh, the one of the question is how much the cell wall contributes versus the contribution of peptide A's mutation against beta lactam resistance. It's 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 rather than the cell wall, you know, cell wall is relevant with regards to diffusion or, or, or permeability of um, beta lactam. That is also part of, you know, there are four different uh, mechanisms for uh, resistance to a drug, right? One of them is permeability of the cell wall or the, the cell wall complex. Indeed, that is relevant, but with regards to many beta lactam and specifically beta lactams and TB, that has never been demonstrated to be the primary cause of resistance to uh, beta lactams. It's actually the transpeptidases. We ourselves have published uh, 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 beta lactamases or, and, and a completely new beta lactamase in, in TB. And it is the transpeptidases that have beta lactamase activity or enzymes that are not transpeptidases but only have beta lactamase activity. They are the primary drivers of beta lactam resistance in mycobacterium tuberculosis. Yeah, so uh, the questions are coming up, but but this is this is very interesting in general because uh, this is the question is uh, does the carbapenems reduce the treatment duration? I know it's lots of activities are going on with the current yes. uh, you know classical treatment, but I'm not sure about yeah. that. Yes, uh, no, that's that we've asked that question for eight years now. Can we reduce the duration of treatment of tuberculosis by using any agent? Right, that has been the burning question for a long time. You know, why right. treat for six months? Or there are new resumes that have come for four months. Why four months? You know, you cannot call uh, dots. You know, directly of the sort therapy and in six months, there is nothing sort about six months with these right. drugs. That you have to take uh, multiple of them for each day. Right, daily. You know, this is very toxic to humans. It's intolerable for many people. So, does carbapenem? Do carbapenems reduce the treatment duration? We don't know the answer to that. Um, my lab hasn't done that work and a lot of uh, uh, labs have not done that work and it's unlikely to be done, uh, uh, that work uh, to be undertaken. Why? I will tell you that. As I told you earlier, carbapenem resistance is reportable and urgently reportable uh, according to CDC guidelines because carbapenems are the last line of defense. Even in India, rest of the world, carbapenems are one of the most expensive drugs. They're very effective, but last line. If you have resistance there, 
you cannot treat a lot of patients, right? They'll end up dying. So you really do not want to use carbapenems for a long uh, amount of time for TB because there's so many people with TB and chronic disease, and there is a hesitancy to use broad spectrum drug like carbapenem uh, in many people. And I think for perhaps for that reason, unless new drugs come and, and there are many more options and carbapenems do not become the last resort, there are many other drugs. I think at that stage, carbapenems will be put forward. But right now it's more like a boutique regimen where, okay, here's a patient, we, we can do a very controlled in hospital setting type of treatment. And the, the, the examples that I gave you with MDR, XDR patients, actually not only MDR, XDR patients in Brussels, those patients were treated at hospital inpatient where you know the the use of drug is very well man monitored the, you know and and under those circumstances yes carbapenems are uh, will be used but i don't think they will see broad uses and with the target of reducing uh, duration of treatment simply because carbapenems are used to treat many many other bacterial infections and we don't want to lose carbapenem to a particular single disease Okay, so with with this response, I would I would like to close the session here. I know it's very very late, almost morning for you, Janu. Thank you very much, and I look forward to the better safety with the double you know beta lactam combination therapy. What you suggested. Thank you very much yeah. from the core of my heart and NMR team and Mirandia team. Thank you so much for you know taking out your busy schedule, and I know this is this is this is not the right time for you for a talk. So no, that's uh, fine. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for uh, everybody for uh, coming and joining this uh, session. Thank bye, -bye. You. bye bye. Good morning, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> okay, bye bye.